All right, we're going to look here at a brief refresher on electron configuration. So assuming you've already experienced this before in your careers. And then also taking a little bit of a look at magnetism and some quantum numbers. So good times here. Okay, so remember when we're looking at the periodic table, there are four main blocks, S, P, D, and F. And those match up with our four main types of orbitals that we talk about, S, P, D, and F. Now, if you're a history buff, where do those letters come from? They come from sharp, principle, diffuse, and fundamental. Pioneering days of spectroscopy, words that were used to describe some of the different things seen on some of our very first um, spectroscope, spectroscopic evidence. Sorry, But again, these blocks are defined based on where the last electron, what kind of orbital the last electron is going into. So our first two groups, their last electron is in an s orbital. Our last six groups on the right, our last electron is being placed in a p orbital. And then we have d and f for the middle portions of the periodic table. So when you look at a periodic table, yes, you can do those like diagrams where you label all the, you know, 1s, 2s, 3s, and, and then draw the arrows and try to remember the order of filling, but just read the periodic table. Okay, so like if I want to know what the electron configuration of let's say nickel is okay here's nickel down here then I just read the periodic table oh school's over hold on so I just read the periodic table so the first row I have 1s2 because there's 2 there then I go 2s2 and I fill up 2p6 <laughs> then I go 3s2 3p6, sorry, I'm not good with the pen, 4s2, and then here I see that it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 electrons over to get to nickel. But you do have to remember that the d's are one less than the s's. So this ends up with 3d8. And you should also remember when we look down here, although we don't really do a bunch with the electron configurations of our lanthanides and actinides, but down here we go 6s, then we go to 4f, then back up to 5d, 6p. Then it would go 7s, 5f, 6d, 7p. But for most of the elements that we need to work with, we can just read the periodic table and get the electron configuration. Now, of course, our electron configurations each element differs from the previous element by one electron. So they just keep building on each other. And you can see that here with our first five elemental electron configurations. You also want to notice though the orbital diagram. Okay, and you possibly have seen it like this, or instead of squares just with lines, or as we'll see here with some not all on the same line, we can have them spaced out based on energy. But when you see the orbital diagrams, we typically show an electron as an arrow. And if we're going to have two electrons in the same orbital, then they have to be having opposite spins, which you can see here with different pointing arrows. <clears throat> if you remember, we have those three main rules that kind of dictate electron configuration. The Aufbau, or build-up principle, says that our electrons tend to be in the lowest energy places. So like our ground state electron configurations which is why we start from 1s and we just keep building up 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, lower energy to higher. We have Hund's rule. Hund's rule deals with like when we're looking at p and d and f orbitals. So like a p sublevel with p orbitals. There's three p orbitals on the sublevel. And Hund's rule basically says we need to put an electron in each orbital before we would go back and start to double up. And then of course Pauli exclusion principle that tells us again that we can only have two electrons in one orbital. And we'll talk about that in a little bit in a little bit more detail in a second here. But here's another orbital diagram and you can see that this time it's spaced out with increasing energy. So I could ask, you know, what element is this representing? And you could count all the little arrows, and you could count and see that there's 26 arrows, 26 electrons is iron. But, you know, you can just look, okay, 
our outer electrons, those are what usually tell the story. So I see here I've got 4s2 and 6 in the 3d. So if you were looking at your periodic table, you could just count over 4s2 and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and you would see that, oh, there's iron. It's the sixth element in the on the 3d sublevel. And so that's how I could know that this is iron, just by looking at those 3d6 electrons. But again, you could count all 26 and get iron, same thing. So the electron configuration of iron, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d6. That gets a little tiresome. And again, since electron configurations build off of each other, we can recognize a shortcut, the noble gas shortcut. Up to here, that is the electron configuration of argon. Argon is the closest noble gas to iron that we have passed on the way to iron. Oh, sorry. What that means, if I go back to my periodic table, so here's argon, and then after argon, this is what's different about iron compared to argon. So I can write the shortened version for iron by substituting in argon for its part. So I just have argon 4s2 3d6. You can also see electron configurations written like this where you group the threes together and then write 4s2. So you might see argon 3d6 4s2. One of our periodic tables that I gave you has that. And that's fine. That's like the um, spectroscopic version. Because as we'll see here a little later when we get into photoelectron spectroscopy, for our transition metals, um, we tend to see a lot of plus two ions. And so, for example, the iron plus two ion, we lose the two 4s electrons. All right, we're going to see that based on spectroscopic evidence, those are indeed the easiest electrons to lose based on how much energy it would take. And then for iron 3, the next electron that's lost is one of the 3d electrons. And so that's why you tend to see the um, like this argon 3d6 4s2, because the 4s2 electrons are the ones that get lost first. All right, and there's other exceptions to electron configurations but there's you know it's such a small little detail compared to the grand scheme of everything else we'll talk about it in class and whatnot but don't focus on all of the crazy exceptions just get the the gist of it and remember all of this comes from mathematical solutions to Schrodinger's wave functions you know this whole notation and and the all, all the orbital notations and sublevels and all that stuff we're going to see photoelectron spectroscopy that proves all of this math. So now when it comes to magnetism, we can have diamagnetic, paramagnetic, and ferromagnetic. A substance is diamagnetic, di sorry, diamagnetic, it means it's not magnetic. All of the electrons are paired up, meaning, you know, every orbital has two electrons in it, every bond, every whatever. Every, the substance has all electrons paired. Magnetism dies. This, these diamagnetic materials are actually repelled by a magnetic field. They would rather die than be attracted to a magnetic field, however you want to remember it. But if we're looking at like elements on the periodic table, our noble gases, alkaline earth metals, and zinc, cadmium, and mercury, those are no notorious diamagnetic materials because they have all paired electrons. Water's diamagnetic. All the electrons are either in a bond or in a lone pair, so they're all paired up. Paramagnetic, I know we we're talking about pairs of electrons, uh, but paramagnetic are actually attracted to a magnetic field because they have one or more unpaired electrons. Now, when this magnetic field is removed, the magnetism is lost, unlike ferromagnetic. Ferromagnetic materials, ferro, iron, the, this is like your traditional magnets that you know. Okay, they, if you introduce them to a magnetic field and then remove the magnetic field, that material will still stay magnetic. So iron, nickel, 
cobalt, and any alloys of these metals are the most common ferromagnets. Now this is this stuff can get crazy fast. You can start talking about superconductors and things like that. But essentially, if you know what the electrons are, if they're all paired, no magnetism. If there's an unpaired electron, it can be affected by a magnetic field. One small little piece, carbon, graphite, is diamagnetic. And now you might think, well, the electron configuration of carbon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And those 2p electrons are not paired. So how can this be? Well, graphene, graphite, a, a layer of carbon graphite actually looks like this. And so even though a carbon atom by itself could be paramagnetic, when it links together with its friends and forms this graphite, no, there are no available unpaired electrons. So the electron configuration helps, but it's not the end all because it also could be the arrangement of the atoms. Okay, again, didn't want to get too crazy on you, but it is what it is, and we're looking into a lot of this stuff for the future of science, so just thought I'd let you know. All right, last thing, quantum numbers. They can be kind of a big deal, but the AP exam is not going to waste our time acting just a direct, blatant quantum number question. But, again, this is the solutions to these math problems, and it's uh, stuff that is still talked about and used today in first year phys uh, chemistry classes and physics. So we are going to discuss them and I'll show you how to use them, but um, don't expect a, a blatant direct quantum number question on the AP exam. They could give you a set of numbers and ask you some stuff about it, but... So every electron has four quantum numbers. The first number is the principal number, which says what electron, the ener what energy level the electron is on. The second quantum number is symbolized L. It's called the azimuthal. And it just tells us what type of orbitals we have, with, or what type of orbital this electron is in. 0 is S, 1 is P, 2 is D, 3 is F, and so on and so forth. But we really only use those. The third number, M sub L, the magnetic one, tells us which orbital in the subshell that this electron is in. Okay, so like a P subshell has three orbitals. So we label them negative one, zero, and one. And we'll see this here in a second. But it helps to tell us where that electron is. And then the last number is the spin, M sub S. The first electron in an orbital gets a plus one half notation. The second electron gets a minus one half notation. So when we talk about electron configuration again, um, the build-up principle energies in the lowest or electrons in the lowest energy places then Hun's rule we spread out in electrons in their own orbitals before we double them up on a sublevel and then Paul the exclusion principle again says hey you know you can only have two electrons in one orbital and if they are in there they spin the opposite way so the grown-up way to say the Pauli exclusion principle no two electrons may have the same four quantum numbers. Again, each set of four quantum numbers is like the address telling us about a single electron. So even in lead with 82 electrons, there are 82 different sets of quantum numbers for every electron in that atom. No two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. Now, bismuth has 83 electrons. The first 82 of them are the same 82 that were in LEDs, and then the 83rd electron has a different set of quantum numbers. So again, they just build on each other like the electron configurations did. All right, so I'm going to stop right here, um, and then I'm going to sh the next little video will have a few sample problems and a little further explanation as far as the quantum numbers are concerned. And then after that, I'll have a little video about photoelectron spectroscopy. All right, hope this helps, and I'll see you soon.